Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are continuing our discussion of Emma by Jane Austen and it is, I'm still behind you guys on the chapters that I was hoping to have read at this point. But that's okay, I have the weekend coming up. So I'm hoping that I will be able to get a lot of reading done tonight possibly even finish it. I have about a quarter of it left and if I really focus and put my cell phone far away from me then that might be possible because I really would like to wrap this ba bad boy up. Eight videos on Emma would be plenty. But anyway, today is Thursday and I have just a couple of notes. We'll make this one quick. Another way that we see Emma really struggling to be in connection with her own emotions is after Frank Churchill leaves. She presumes that she must be in love with him as she observes her own behavior almost as if she were watching it from the outside. She observes that she's listless. She observes that she can't focus on things. The other explanation might be that she's just bored. So if we look at it in context, Emma has been you know, stuck at home. She's never gone to London. She's never had a season. She's never been sort of presented at court or at any of the big like balls in Bath or any of the other types of like sort of watering holes and social cities. And in fact, some of the dancing that Frank Churchill brings to Highbury is some of the only like real balls and dance parties that she's going to have participated in. Of course, we know that the ball gets cut off before it can actually be put on due to Frank Churchill's unreasonable relations. So I think it's actually much more likely that Emma is just a little bit bored with her normal day-to-day -day life, which is quite cloistered. In chapter 13, Emma realizes that even in her imaginative world, she would not love Frank Churchill. The interesting thing, much of what she imagines must be what's actually going on between Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax interesting dialogues, elegant letters, this secret affair that she is imaginatively creating in her own mind must be very similar to the reality of what those two are actually experiencing. She resolves not to encourage him, but <laughs> having much experience with her resolutions in the past, whether they be reading lists or artwork, or whatever the case may be, we know, or we can at least predict that it's unlikely that she will keep this resolution. Once Emma dispenses of the idea that she might be in love with Frank Churchill, though she hasn't dispensed with the idea that he might be in love with her, she is happy enough to pass him off to Harriet Smith. And only once she is determined that he's not good enough to inspire her own love. Speaking of Harriet Smith, Harriet Smith is still smitten with both Mr. Elton and Robert Martin still alternating between those subjects, much to Emma's frustration. <laughs> it's definitely wearing on Emma's patience. And Emma finally gets Harriet to stop worrying about it and returning over the subject over and over again by referring to her own emotions and asking Harriet to be considerate of her emotions. Now, it took a great deal of forbearance on Emma's side before she made this argument, before she got to this point. So I do want to give her props there. But I just find it really interesting that this is the argument of all the arguments that succeeds with Harriet Smith. And why should it not? Emma has specifically picked out Harriet because she is so malleable, because Harriet Smith puts Emma first exactly the way that Emma likes to think of herself. In chapter 14 of the second volume, we get to meet Mrs. Elton, and this is a lot of fun. Here, Emma makes a judgment based on character rather than on her own snobbish sort of rules of who is good or better than other people. And it's the first time that her judgment of somebody else's character has actually made sense to me. So she notices that Mrs. Elton is vain and puffed up and ignorant, and she also quite rightly notes that Harriet Smith would be a better wife to Mr. Elton because Harriet Smith is a better person than Mrs. Elton for all her wealth, for all her lucky connections through her sister, through all, you know, that education gave her. She is not as good as Harriet Smith. Harriet Smith is actually kind and considerate, actually has a good character, does not suffer from vanity, 
And we see that Mrs. Elton frequently talks about Mabel Grove, which is the family seat of her brother-in-law, the husband of her sister. And even though Miss Hawkins slash Mrs. Elton and her sister come from a family that has recently gotten wealthy by trade, she appropriates sort of like the family seat to herself. And this again speaks to that idea of history. You can compare it to Pride and Prejudice, which we recently discussed, in the way that Bingley is considering adding a family seat to his family's sort of property and wealth because they're newly rich, they don't have an inherited family house. Another really interesting sort of fringe thing to pay attention to is carriages. Now I haven't really talked about this much with regards to other books. We will talk about it when we discuss the Watsons because it also comes up there. But carriages as a symbol of wealth is something, it's sort of like, you know, just a symbolic little piece to take to, to pay attention to. Mrs. Elton makes a very strong point of discussing her brother-in-law's carriages. He apparently has at least two that she mentions at this point. And she, we also have the discussion of Frank Churchill's carriage. We also have the discussion of Mr. Knightley's carriage and how he's not, you know, he chooses not to keep horses regularly to, to use his carriage because they're expensive. And Austin basically uses this as a touchstone or a flag for you to pay attention to how wealthy a family is. The other thing that I think, you know, I have been going back and forth on do I like Emma? She's kind of snobby. She can be selfish. She, you know, does take to heart criticism. She does sort of chastise herself. She wants to be a better person. So I kind of go back and forth with Emma. Like, she's not the worst in the world, but she's hard for me to be sympathetic to. And then Mrs. Elton comes on the scene. And it's like, oh, there's a truly awful character. It is delightful to join Emma and the narrator in despising Mrs. Elton because she's the worst, right? And I think that there's a sense in which Emma does not do well in comparison to Harriet Smith or, and, and particularly in the way that she uses her friendship with Harriet. Notice how Harriet goes by the sidelines when something interesting is happening with Frank Churchill or something that Emma would rather be doing. Emma does not shine well in comparison to Jane Fairfax because Jane Fairfax is just so proper and so sympathetic being this orphan and all of this. But Mrs. Elton comes on the scene and Emma starts looking not nearly so awful. So I think it's really interesting that you know, the mean girl, the foil for Emma, comes in so late in the book. It's really, you know, in the third quarter of the book that this character comes on the scene and we really get to see Emma in a more positive light, or at least that's that's my experience reading it this time through. And, you know, Emma's going to have her foibles and her flaws. I know some heavy Frank Churchill flirtation is coming up, which is really quite cruel to Jane Fairfax, even if Emma doesn't realize it. And obviously the famous scene where she's going to be quite cruel to Miss Bates. And so it's not that Emma's going to come out looking perfect. She never does. But she starts to look quite a bit better. Now, I was thinking about Sense and Sensibility because that's another book in which the sort of mean girl foil comes in so much later. So Lucy Steele comes in quite a bit later in that novel. But Eleanor is just so good. You like Eleanor so much, or at least I do. I like Eleanor a lot. So I don't need Lucy Steele to m help me like Eleanor. Lucy Steele just becomes like sort of another like nail-biting torture for poor Eleanor who's holding everything in. Jane Austen, Austen writes these snobby characters so well and I think we just all love to watch them be awful and judge them from the sidelines along with her. In chapter 15, Emma calls Jane Fairfax a riddle and indeed she is. Even though Mrs. Elton is a terror, she is right to give attention to Jane Fairfax, which comes up quite explicitly in that conversation. But the other thing that I find really interesting is that the way in which Emma kind of just holds court during this whole conversation with Mr. Weston, or excuse me, Mrs. Weston and Mr. Knightley. They each submit their opinions of what Jane's motivations possibly are, what she may be thinking, what could be the circumstances driving her to spend so much time with Mrs. Elton. And Emma sort of picks her favorite opinion and goes, well, thank you for your submissions. This is the one that I'm going to choose to run with and sort of believe. 
and speaks to that, that level of authority, that level of power that she has. So those are my observations for the next few chapters that I've read. Wish me luck, I'd really like to finish up this book so that we can finish up our conversation about it as well. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.